Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our Sit Up Spiritual Impact Training using prayer and scripture. I am Tony Burt Brown coming with our spiritual nourishment today, our word that goes along with our morning prayer. If you've not yet joined us for morning prayer, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, please check out the information underneath this YouTube video. And while you're there, if you've not yet subscribed, Hit the subscribe button and the bell if you want to receive notifications when I upload videos. So, we are continuing our study in the book of Genesis. And again, this is about spiritual nourishment, spiritual growth, so that we are growing, changing, progressing. We're being impacted by the word of God so that we can impact the world. We're here intentionally on purpose for God's glory, to be witnesses, to represent the kingdom, to do the will of God. But we have to know the will of God, which means we have to get in the word of God and we have to be, walk in the word of God, live by the spirit of God, right? God has given us everything that we need. And so we want to get in this word because the Bible instructs us to meditate on it day and night. So we can be careful to do all this written in it so we can be prosperous and have good success. And so listen, this prospering is not about being rich. This is about being rich in the word and in power and authority and having God's wisdom. This is about us growing in relationship with God. The Bible says when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. But you can't get to the father but through the Son, and Jesus, the Son, is also the living Word of God. So you can't get to God without walking in His Word, abiding in His Son. And so, we are in Genesis chapter 25. If you missed the first 24 chapters, please go back, check out this channel, and get those lessons and go back and meditate on them. Amen? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come right now and we rejoice in you. We bless your name. We honor you, God. We thank you that you are the great I am. We thank you for your word, your Holy Spirit. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is our teacher. And we ask that you would give us your word today. And with all our getting, that we get understanding. So fill us up, God, that we will be changed from the inside out, never to be the same. We are careful to give you all praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't forget, get your pen, get your paper so you can write down any notes, any scriptures so you can go back and you can study so that you can get even more word, even more nourishment and more understanding. And so we are in Genesis, as I stated, chapter 25. And so we've already talked about Abraham when he had been, was getting old, stricken of age. He called his servant in the last chapter, had him go and find his son Isaac a wife from his kindred, from his family. So he wouldn't marry one of the Canaanite women. We know there was a promise that Abraham's descendants were going to, you know, hundreds of years later, going to come back to the land where he was dwelling and take it and it was going to be their promised land. And so... Um, though it is the land of Canaan, it is where his descendants were. Uh, he was promised his descendants were going to have that land. These were people that didn't follow God and honor God. And so he did not want Isaac to find a wife there. And so now we are in chapter 25. And in chapter 25, this lets us know that when Sarah died uh, a couple of chapters ago, right? This lets us know in chapter 25 that Abraham took on another wife. So it tells us in chapter 25, verse 1. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, and Latushim, and Lumim. And the sons of Midian, Ephah and Ephor, and Hanak and Abadah and Eldah. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived a hundred three score and fifteen years. Um, and then it says, then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man, fully years, and was gathered to his people. So he lived, uh, Abraham lived a hundred and seventy-five years, right? He lived... Um, 
a hundred years after the promise was given to him. Excuse me. Okay. He was he lived a hundred years after God called him away from his father's house, told him he was going to be a, a father of a great nation. He was going to be blessed. Those that blessed him will be blessed. Those that cursed him will be cursed. So a hundred years, right? He waited 25 years for his promised son, but then he was able to enjoy for 75 years seeing his son grow up, his son get married, all these different things, right? And he had even lost Sarah as a wife, but he took on another wife and it names the sons, the children that they had. And so as we read through here though, these are the children of Keturah that we uh, listed off. However, in verse five, it tells us Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. And so even though he gave gifts to his other children, right? Isaac was the one that was the heir, the one that the promise was coming through. And so we have to remember that, you know, in these times, there was the firstborn who typically received a double portion, the inheritance, a blessing, right? The birthright. Now we know that Ishmael was actually Abraham's first son, but he was through Hagar, not through Sarah. Sarah was the one that was to have the promised son. It was Abraham and Sarah. God doesn't change his mind because we step ahead of him because we try to take over. God was clear in telling Abraham that the promise was coming through Isaac, that his people were coming through Isaac. Isaac was the one that was the promised child. And so Abraham gave him all, even though he gave gifts to the other children, he gave all of his um, wealth and everything to Isaac. And so then it tells us, um, in verse, after Abraham dies at 175 years old, then it tells us, um, in verse nine, and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of, uh, Machpelah, Machpelah, in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zorah, the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. So if we remember when Sarah died, that Abraham bought this cave, right? He bought this place for them to be buried. He buried Sarah there, but I had told you then that he too would be buried there in Isaac. And, and so the sons Isaac and Ishmael, those are the only two that are named here that bury Abraham in this cave. So even though they were split up, even though... Um, Ishmael and his mother Hagar had been sent off when Ishmael was 13 because he was mocking Isaac and Sarah got angry and she told Abraham, send them away. Even though Ishmael has, you know, uh, married outside of, you know, their family, he is, you know, even though, you know, they uh, are not talked about as having any type of relationship up to this point, they came together and buried their father together in the same place that um, Sarah was buried in the same cave, in the same place. And then it tells us in verse 11, it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelled in the, in the well of Leheroi. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, who, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. So now it's telling us these are the ones that were born to Ishmael. Ishmael was the son that Abraham had through Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden. Um, and it tells us um, the firstborn of Ishmael, uh, Neboeth, Keter, Adbil, and Mipsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadar, and Tima, Jeter, Nathish, and Kadima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns and by their castles, 12 princes according to their nations. Remember that when God let Abraham know that Ishmael is not the promised son, Isaac is, but he let Abraham know, I'm going to bless him, to be a nation because he's your seed, because he belongs to you. So even though Ishmael wasn't the one that the promise was coming through where Abraham would be the father of a great nation, just because Ishmael belonged to him, because it was his seed, he was going to be blessed. And there would be 
12 nations, 12 tribes rather. And so it says these are 12 princes according to their nations. Verse 17, and these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 130 and seven years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. So Ishmael lived to be 137 years old. And so in verse 18, they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, that is before Egypt, and thou, as thou goest toward Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. Now remember, Rebekah is the wife that Abraham, servant in the last chapter, went and got for Isaac. So Isaac marries her at the age of 40, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanamra, the, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And as Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord... I'm sorry, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So here we have, just like his father Abram, Abram and Sarai had been married. They, they were unable to have children. Sarai was barren for years, even when um, Abram was called and told about the promise. He and, and Sarai was really too old. And then as they waited and waited and waited, that's why Sarai had sent Abram to her handmaiden Hagar to have a son because she just figured it wasn't going to happen. Well, now their son Isaac is married to Rebekah. She's barren, but he began to pray. He began to entreat God to intercede for her, to intercede for them that they would be able to have a child. So prayer, when you see an area of your life that is barren, it's not growing, it's not producing, it's not changing. It is good and it is okay to entreat God, to pray, to, you know, to come before him because God is the one that causes growth. He's the one that causes, you know, wounds to be open. He is the one that is able to cause us to produce, to bear fruit, to have children, to move forward in dreams and vision and purpose and plans. Everything good comes from God and we have to be willing to pray and not always just sit back. So he entreats the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah conceived. So his wife was then able um, to get pregnant and the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And so now she has twins within her and they're fighting on the inside and she's wondering why. In verse 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. So now they're fighting in the midst of her, and God tells her, in the womb, there's two nations in your womb. So now remember, now Abraham was supposed to be the father of a great nation, right? But he went and had Ishmael, but Ishmael was not the promised child. Isaac was the one that Abraham had with Sarai. So at some point, Ishmael, when he was 13 and Isaac was born and Isaac began to grow and then Ishmael was making fun or mocking Isaac. So there was a division. That division is still yet today. However, now we see another situation coming about where Isaac, the son, is married to Rebekah. They conceive twins. They are two different nations. They are struggling on the inside of her womb. The Bible tells us that they were born, in verse 25, the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. And so they are fighting in the womb. When they come out, Esau is first, right? But, I, but Jacob is holding on to his heel. Jacob was trying to come out first. There was a battle going on on the inside. And it says the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter, the man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. They have favorites. So Isaac's favorite is Esau, the firstborn. Rebekah's favorite is Jacob, the secondborn. Jacob sawed pottage. Esau came from the field and he was faint. Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I'm faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. 
And Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. Now, listen, they, Jacob was trying to get out first from the womb. Because the firstborn, again, gets the birthright, gets the blessings, gets the inheritance, becomes the leader of the family. And so, but you were able to sell your birthright if you wanted to, but you lose everything. So here it is. Esau is out in the field. He comes in. He's faint, it says. He's hungry. And Jacob has a pot of stew or a pot of pottage. And Jacob says, sell me your birthright. He's going to feed him if he gives the birthright up. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. What prophet showed this birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now this is the thing. Esau wanted to feed his flesh. Surely he wasn't going to die from not eating that day. Some have fasted for days. Jesus fasted for 40 days. He wasn't going to die. I mean, we think how silly is that to sell your whole birthright, being the leader of the family, having the inheritance, the blessing of the father, be, you know, getting a double portion of the inheritance. You get a double portion, the firstborn. And so, but this is the thing we think, how crazy is that? It doesn't make sense. Why would he do that? But think of all the times. That we have wanted to feed our flesh and given up a blessing of God. Given up or separated ourselves from the Lord. Turned away from him because of something that we wanted with a carnal mind, with our flesh, our lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. People do it all the time. And so the thing is, is that this is final. Once you sold your birthright, that was it. There was no getting it back. And so he was thinking of his flesh. And it says he despised his birthright. That means he didn't care anything about it. He cared more about his flesh. Now, this is a lesson. And you go back and meditate on this chapter, but think about it. The principle, the lesson in this. Is there anything in your life that you are allowing to take first place that is hindering you from walking in purpose, being the man or woman of God that God purposed you to be, created you to be? The things that are promised through us being saved, being in the... Um, in right relationship with God, knowing Jesus as our Savior. The Bible tells us that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. But that means that we have to be in Christ. We have to walk after the Spirit. We have to walk in the Word. Have we given up what God has offered us as His sons and His daughters to fulfill the lust of our flesh, to go out here and do things we know are contrary to His Word, that we have caused ourselves to be yet a divided again, falling back into old ways, old habits, or have you not yet even made the commitment to walk with God because of something you don't want to let go of, an ungodly relationship, a habit, a mindset. Are you holding on to grudges against others? Are you refusing to totally surrender your life to God? Is your flesh more important than your birthright, than your inheritance? Because the Bible lets us know in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God or inherit the kingdom of God. Only those that do the will of the Father. And so even though he says this, some will say, we prophesy in your name. We, we heal, you know, the sicker. You know, he's basically saying the people in the church that are doing church work, that are operating in signs and wonders, are going to assume that they have eternal life, but they're not. So just because Esau lived in the house with the father and he was the firstborn, he gave up his birthright. He sold it to fulfill the lust of his flesh. So he gave it up. Do you despise your birthright? Through Christ, we become adopted heirs of God. His children, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We've been given a measure of faith. We've been given power and authority, the Holy Spirit, the anointing. We've been given a call on our life. Are we refusing to walk in the call? Are we refusing to surrender all? This is what we want to do today is do a self-examination. Have I given up my birthright? Am I selling out on the things that are promised to me? Am I not walking in the power and authority that's been delegated to me because I'm still fulfilling the lust of the flesh, still walking apart from God, still you know, chasing after this and doing that and not letting go of certain things that he's told me to. Let's examine ourselves today. Go back and look at this because the Bible tells us that he despises birthright. When we don't put that first, our relationship with the Father and the things that he offers us is as though we despise our birthright. And so the Bible lets us know as you read that it says God hated Esau in the womb, but he loved Jacob. And this lets us know he already knew that Esau was going to give up his birthright. What about us? The things that are offered us, are we grateful? Are we thankful? Are we surrendered to God? Are we yielded to him? Because just as the children of Israel 
the first generation, when they were on their way to the promised land, that first generation missed out on the promised land. They had been delivered from Egypt, delivered from bondage. They were on their way to the promised land, but they didn't make it because of the lack of faith and disobedience. So we can be delivered from our past. We can say we received Jesus Christ, but do we? Or do we keep looking back? Are we going to miss the promised land for us? Eternal life. Because we keep going back, falling back, looking back, not letting go of the past, not letting go of the old man and the flesh. So today is a day of self-examination. Go back and meditate on this chapter. Get the principles, the other principles, and see. Because Jacob wanted it enough. He was trying to get it in the womb. He wanted to be the firstborn. And the 12 tribes of Israel are going to come through Jacob because Jacob wanted it enough that he was striving for it in the womb. And he was still fighting for it as an adult. And so he got it. And so this is the thing. How bad do you want it? So we're going to close out in prayer. Go back and meditate on this and realize you ain't going to die if you don't get that thing that your flesh wants. But you can die if you put that thing above what God has offered you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we rejoice in you and praise you and honor you. We glorify you. We thank you, God. You are the great I am. We thank you, Lord God, Father, for what you've done in us and through us and for us. Help us to desire what you have for us, to walk in your will and in your ways for your glory. We honor you today. We bless your name and thank you for who you are, all that you've done, what you're doing, and what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and I'll see you on our next sit-ups.